welcome to the Excel Cast. I'm Jonathan Kuskiski, the Assistant Director for the Excel Program here at the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater and Dance. And today, uh, I've got some very special guests, Third Coast Percussion, who's here to talk to us about investing uh, in our strengths as sort of a, as a strategy, baseline foundational strategy uh, for growing an arts organization. Um, so welcome, Sean, Rob, Peter, and David. Thank you so much for taking some time while you're here on campus to talk with us today. Thanks for having yeah, me. Nice to be here. Great. So let's jump right in. So Third Coast, Third Coast Percussion, you are a percussion quartet, um, which would maybe, to an outsider uh, who's not familiar, maybe assume that you all have the same strengths because you all play the same instrument. But um, you are also a self-managed uh, organization, which means that you all have administrative roles in addition to your varied performance um, uh, responsibilities in the group. Can you talk a little bit about how you have organized the ensemble um, in terms of both the administrative side, but also the artistic directorship um, piece, and then what it's like to perform as a, as a percussion quartet? Sure. So um, we uh, are co-artistic directors of the ensemble. So each of us shares 25% of the uh, responsibility of mm -hmm. steering the artistic direction of the group, whether it's programming or, or thinking about um, commissions or that sort of thing. But we each have administrative roles. Um, we're responsible for different areas of the administration of the organization. So my role, I'm the executive director, um, and my main um, responsibilities um, uh, under that heading are... Um, booking the group and working with our managing director to book uh, our engagements, managing our um, long-term relationships, whether it's our board of directors or our ensemble and residence position, um, and um, uh, sort of helping to organize the process by which we do our long-term planning, three to five year planning. And, uh, look, you're really looking closely at where we are right now and where we want to be. Great. Yeah, and uh, so in addition to the core artistic director, I'm the finance director of, of the group. So um, uh, anything sort of money, cash in, cash out, <laughs> uh, I'm involved in. You know, on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm taking care of our bookkeeping, you know. Um, but I'm also, um, you know, kind of managing our payroll and, you know, our monthly, quarterly, and annual filing. Um, we're audited every year, so I manage or spearhead that with our audi auditing agency. Um, I also work closely with our treasurer. Um, developing budgets, maintaining budgets not only for our current fiscal year, but also like thinking about as Dave was pointing out, you know, like the future years and like uh, where we want to be next year, where mm. we want to be the year after that, and just making sure that our 501c3 status is is good and responsible. And uh, yeah, yeah. As Peter alluded to, Third Coast Percussion is a 501c3 organization, uh, so that means that we're a not-for-profit organization that can accept donations and grants. Uh, so I'm the development director, and that falls under my purview. So uh, I do all of our grant writing and reporting on the grants that we get from private foundations and government agencies. Uh, and then also spearhead our individual giving campaigns, uh, hosting fundraising events and sort of seasonal uh, fundraising focuses at different times throughout the year. And I'm the technical director, which means that I deal with uh, logistics and production related issues. Mm -hmm. So um, travel and accommodations, but also communicating with venues. And there's a kind of an extra layer, if you're a percussion ensemble, of managing all the instruments and, mm -hmm. and dealing with that. Um, we should say, too, that we, we now have two non-performing employees. Um, Liz Pesnell, who is our managing director, mm -hmm. and she works very closely with Dave to, to book um, uh, engagements and, and deals a lot with that and, and uh, publicity. and promoting the group, and Colin Campbell, who is a U of M alum. Go Blue! <laughs> <laughs> um, and he is our uh, studio manager. Okay. So he is part-time right now, and um, he helps with the enormous task of setting up and breaking down all of our gear. And then I, I would like to add, too, that these are uh, areas that we are responsible for, but we consistently ask each other for help in, in our certain areas. And then there are there are tasks that pop up every now and then that don't neatly fall into those headings, but this is a way for us to manage the million and a half things that we need to do and not have to have a discussion every single time something pops up. Right. That's huge. So, and you've been uh, together as a group for about 12 years, is that yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So at what point did you determine these roles? I don't know if you came up with the titles, you know, early on or if those evolved organically. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that and how you sort of settled upon this sort of breakdown of roles for the four of you? We, um, there was an, a, certainly an aspect of arriving at where we are right now that was organic. Um, um, when the group started, 
it was just the four of us wanting to play percussion concerts because we love percussion music. Um, and, and basically by just learning by doing, we figured out all of the things that go into uh, you know, playing percussion concerts, but um, marketing them well, and, you know, uh, creating the infrastructure to make sure that your artistic endeavors are successful and that sort of thing. Um, so a lot of our process has been, um, uh, in the early stages, asking a lot of advice of uh, organizations similar to ours that have been around longer. Um, and then gradually over the years, learning where our strengths lie. Mm. Like Pete is our finance director, uh, initially because he was the guy who opened our bank account and that's pretty much the only uh, uh, training he ever had. None of us have any uh, formal training in any of these areas with possible exception of setting up and tearing down production. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know um, Pete is an incredibly uh, uh, adept at like detail-oriented thinking and keeping close records of things and anything that you ever put on your to-do list gets done exactly when you say it's going to get done. <laughs> and that's the kind of person that you want to have mm -hmm. managing your finances. Um, whereas I am like super comfortable and excited about um, uh, thinking about how in, you know, you know, starting to think in the year like 2008 about how we wanted this to be a full-time job for all of four of us. And knowing that in 2012 that might be possible if X, Y, and Z happen, and like blotting out how that could. Um, I like that kind of thing. Mm. So there was a little bit of sort of just yeah. figuring that out over the years. I would say too that you know uh, when we started realizing these positions, and then we um, uh, once we had any money at all, <laughs> uh, we and, and not only uh, were we did we did we start making a little bit of income just out, off of our performance activity, but you know, we recognize these roles and also we recognize the fact that we were doing all of these administ administrative tasks, you know, in between all of these performance yeah. engagements. So, you know, early on we would have like, you know, really intense couple weeks of performances and then wouldn't do anything for a couple months uh, in terms of performance, uh, but we were still working. And so uh, we realized that it might make more sense now because we are working for Third Coast all the time, every mm -hmm. week that we should maybe start spreading out that operating budget in terms of how we're paying ourselves okay. over the course of the year too and that uh, that sort of motivated us then to start even doing timesheets mm -hmm. so we we actually decided that we wanted to do timesheets which is an odd decision to make, <laughs> I think yeah, yeah. Um, but but that was really interesting because we started keeping records of what we were doing administrative wise and then and, and it really showed how much time individually we were putting into it and I think that kind of further helped us sort of parse things out. When, when Sean came in too, you know, he obviously was taking over um, a position that had already existed, but he was also able to, I think, you know, take over some of the stuff that we were doing individually. I know that like Dave had been doing so much stuff. Um, one of them was doing um, itineraries or taking care of itineraries on touring and that kind of fell. Uh, Sean sort of took that over as part of his job. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, there's been, um, it's been a combination of like, what am I interested in doing? What am I, uh, what, suits me well for my own skill set but then also like there's x amount of time <laughs> and we all four need to be working x amount of time and we need to divvy it out sort of proportionally there's also an element to codifying these different roles i think that um was out of necessity in uh communicating with the various parties mm -hmm. we were communicating with as an organization sure. Sure, sure. so it reached a point where it was uh you know dave was going to be communicating with presenters and they want to know so who are you like, what is it that you do <laughs> yeah. in the group, and why am I talking to you? Right. Uh, so they have a clear understanding of what that conversation is. And so we decided we need to have an executive director yeah. uh, who is the person then that the presenters are going to be wanting to talk to, and that should be David. And likewise, if I'm completing a grant application, yeah. uh, and they and I'm going to sign it and say who it is that's completing this application or who they should call about it, yeah. again, it's who is this person. And, oh, uh, I guess that person should be called development director? <laughs> cool. Well, So we sort of assigned uh, those rules based on things that were uh, buckets of things that had to be done, yeah. uh, but also that we wanted to be able to communicate to anyone on a first uh, first communication who I am and why we're having this conversation. Yeah. That's great. So going back to this sort of talking point at the beginning, this idea of investing in strengths, um, I think that quite often what happens um, with uh, performing arts ventures of different types is that, you know, you have sort of the creative work, which is really what drives you to do whatever that enterprise is. And then the sort of administrative work kind of gets divvied up 
based on necessity, maybe, but maybe without that other element. So in other words, it's quite often that, you know, oh, well, there's one person willing to do this one thing nobody else wants to do, mm -hmm. and that person therefore gets, you know, you know, has stuck with that work, so to speak. <laughs> um, but the problem is that beyond, that there's a, that's not a recipe for longevity quite often, right? Because as, you know, if your hope is to continue and grow, then that role only gets larger and the responsibility in, in integral kind of component of the enterprise only grows with it. So um, in other words, you know, if you want to grow to the point where you have a person that can take over some of the technical setup demands, you want to have a supervisor uh, in the core group that knows every element of it and is passionate about it and all that kind of thing. So it just makes, yeah. makes sense. Plus, I'd imagine that there's, it's it's not um, you know sometimes we talk about those things as extra musical skills, mm -hmm. but I'm sure it's not in, ter in terms of time extra. It's built into the everyday life yeah. of your ensemble. So can you talk a little bit about how you organize that piece of your life? So you've got the core artistic direction, which in, I understand would be shared equally, but I'm sure that doesn't mean that you everyone makes 25% of the decisions. Probably <laughs> it's probably a little more complex than that. Yeah. You have that piece, which I like to hear more about. Yeah. You've got this administrative work you've spoken about, and then you actually have rehearsing to do yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. How do you organize that component on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, maybe when you're not touring, when you're sort of in Chicago sure. on a normal day. We um, we made a decision uh, when we uh, had the opportunity to start working full-time for Third Coast Percussion, that we wanted, um, when we weren't on tour, to have a regular schedule. And not all groups do that, but for us it's worked really, really well. Um, so when we're in Chicago, uh, you know, at home, not on tour, not performing in Chicago, um, we work from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., and we take an hour lunch, and then we work from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and that set work day is um, uh, when all four of us agreed to be at our studio and office space in Chicago. Um, some of that time is spent rehearsing, some of that time is spent on administrative work, um, but we never have to decide on a normal basis when we're going to be all together to work. And for us, um, that uh, has been extremely valuable because of um, something we were talking about earlier, this idea of decision fatigue. We have to constantly constantly make decisions all day long. There's no one except for the four of us and Liz mm. to make any of the decisions. Um, so um, it's hard. Yeah. I mean, you know, we have to say, what do we want to record next? What do we want um, our next touring show to be? Um, what, do we, what do we want our next administrative hire to be? Do we want to uh, raise salaries? And how does that affect everything else that we're doing? There's a lot of like really big decisions to make. We don't also want to, at the end of every day, say, okay, what time will we see you tomorrow? Um, I think that that would, uh, that would be a big pain. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, um, so and, it's, and of course, there's an obvious component of that we can't rehearse unless all four of us are in the same place. Sure, right. But uh, what's interesting from an administrative perspective is how incredibly efficient it is for me to be at a laptop and Sean to be at a laptop and me to like call over my shoulder, hey man, when we're in Maryland next week, um, are we uh, bringing our own member, are they providing it? Right. Rather than me writing an email to Sean, who might at that point be thinking about something else. Right. That seems like a small thing, but I think that saves us hours and hours of work each week um, yeah. with that kind of efficiency. We also, we also, you talked about like artistic um, yeah. planning. We um, we set uh, meetings regularly, and it's very easy to schedule, relatively easy to schedule meetings. We don't have to check for availability mm -hmm. if it's between ten and one and two and six, um, and we're in Chicago. Um, anyone can set a meeting. Mm -hmm. And then we can just say, you know, we can wake up every day, look at our calendar and say, yeah. okay, I, I know not only that I have this meeting, but you can look ahead and say, oh man, we're talking about that album on Friday and I know there's some key decisions that need to be made. Um, I, I want to be able to think about it ahead of time. Right. Um, because, uh, you know, then, then you're sort of dealing with the challenge, which is a real one of, of splitting your brain capacity between administrative and artistic tasks. And it works the same way for artistic tax too. We we don't just say ten to one rehearsal. We get really specific. <laughs> we say it's this movement of this piece for forty five minutes. Then we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to have this meeting, and Colin will come in, change the room over, set up for this piece. And um, having Colin on the on the team is awesome because we can do that. But we used to have to take time to change the room over and everything. 
Um, mm. But yeah, all of these meetings have specific guided topics to them, whether it be next year's uh, budget mm -hmm. or talking about a new album or everything that Dave just said. Mm -hmm. And artistically, it's, it goes the same uh, goes the same way for our rehearsal schedule, and that really helps uh, to prepare because all of our practicing is done outside those hours. Right. Uh, so if we look ahead and we say, okay, we're playing X, Y, and Z this week. Z is coming on Friday. I don't have to practice that tonight. <laughs> I really need to look at the second movement of why. Yeah. Or else I'm going to be, I'm going to really let those guys down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're also, our mantra is have a plan, be flexible. Uh, so I think we've gotten very good at planning all these things as far in advance as we can so that everyone can be prepared for things. Um, but we're also a small enough organization that we can still call an audible sometimes and say, you know what, I think we probably need to rehearse this piece a little bit longer once we've started rehearsal and push some things back or... Um, or hey, can we move that meeting up to this afternoon instead of tomorrow? And we can. It's easy for us to communicate about that stuff, but we always have the plan in place so that um, we're never starting from zero on anything. And um, yeah, it's one of the nice things, the beautiful things about being an artist-run organization and being small. It's like you always have that fluidity, you know, and you also like know like what the priorities are, you know, both artistically and administratively, and can make those decisions like on the fly. Yeah. Well, it seems like your structure has, you created a structure that allows for that yeah. to occur because you've taken away, um, we talked in, a, in the uh, non-recorded talk earlier today about decision fatigue, and you've removed a lot of the, the decisions, the small decisions that could create fatigue, like setting up meetings and trying to figure out when you're all available, that allows you to be more fluid. Um, which seems to me that, you know, in a more meta scale, you've invested in the, the it seems like not, not every organization is that organized, by the way, right? That has such a clearly defined structure to allow it to operate efficiently yeah. in this way. Um, and so it seems like you've in, intentionally, uh, you know, created a structure that's going to serve you best based on your strengths. It's sort of a way of investing in your strengths on a meta scale. Yeah. I'm wondering, just as a closing um, topic before we run, run out of time, is how that translates to the artistic programming itself, the decisions that you make. So... I think, an assumption, again, an assumption could be made that, oh, you're a percussion quartet, so that's a specific thing. But there are many different groups that have the same, you know, four players on those, you know, they're all percussionists or all whatever, string players or saxophonists, and that doesn't mean that they have the same artistic goals, right? Yeah. So how, how do you think about that in turn? I mean, how do you think about sort of the artistic direction of the group? Um, and what are sort of the priorities that you have? And, and maybe, you know, where did those originate from and how have they evolved? Well, we all, um, both individually and collectively, have a lot of different types of music that we like. A lot of different composers, uh, Western classical music, also just a lot of different um, styles of music outside of, of Western classical music. And um, maybe if there's like one thing that unites us uh, artistically, it is um, that we're each omnivorous. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think that that has been important in defining the group. And I actually think that the um, ability, willingness, uh, and if it is, a, I, th I think, a strength of our organization that we are so organized, it allows that allows that organization administratively allows us to do more projects because it's a big pain to do five or six or ten or fifteen different uh, unique concert programs in a year as a percussion group because each one of them. There's the artistic decisions that go into it, but there's also enormous uh, logistical uh, hassles that come with any single concert program. Mm -hmm. And if we weren't so organized, we would just have to say, we're going to do one, maybe two programs a year, and that's it. And that wouldn't be as artistically, artistically satisfying for us. And frankly, I don't think that uh, we would have as many opportunities mm -hmm. to perform because um, uh, you know we get uh, asked to play this program over here and this program over here. Right. Um, and that makes us both artistically satisfied and gives us more work. Yeah, I think we, by nature as percussionists, we're, we understand the fact very well that the most, more diverse you are as a musician, the more opportunities you will have. And I think that's kind of like sort of fed into our organization. And, and sometimes, sometimes, to be honest, it can be a little bit difficult. It can make, make things difficult or frustrating because like, you know, when you're trying to give like an elevator pitch, yeah. You know, to like, like what, what is your identity? Like, yeah. tell me <laughs> in five words or less, yeah. you know. Um, and, uh, and, and for us who, for our ensemble, which is, you know, we, we, uh, there's, uh, we don't occupy just like sort of not only one genre, but one sort of like set of aesthetics or something. Like we, we like jumping around all over those borders. And um, 
Yeah, so, so, so there, there are things that can be difficult as a result of that, like, like trying to define, you know, sort of who you are to somebody who doesn't know, you know, what, what you're doing. But I think for us, as Dave was saying, it, it also allows for more opportunity, uh, not only opportunity for us professionally as an organization, but then it's also maybe ultimately more fulfilling for us individually because we have all those different experiences and we're not tied to just one thing. Yeah, and I think as an, as musicians, I think we, uh, you know, based on our training and our talents or whatever we bring to it, I think there's a lot of music that we play really well that we feel really comfortable mm-hmm. playing and enjoy playing. Yeah. You know? So I think we, I think we play Steve Reich's music really well, and I think we play Philippe Menoré's music really well, or Sanakis really well. Yeah. Um, and so I think we want to, and then you know, have opportunities sometimes to stretch into things that we've never done before, right. and that can be really exciting. And I think when we're thinking about programming, we try to uh, plan a little bit. Thinking about sort of what are what is the entry way for people who may have probably never heard a percussion concert before? How are we winning them over if yeah. they have no idea what we do? And then how are we introducing them to something co- completely new and unfamiliar that will uh, maybe give them a little bit more of a hopefully some kind of revelation or just feeling like they've connected with something completely unfamiliar to them? That's great. Well, I wish we had more time to talk with you, um, but it's been great to have the chance to speak with you about all this. And obviously, great to see you, you know, continuing to grow and evolve. Obviously, you've had a big success recently, just won your first Grammy. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, and here uh, on campus to perform tomorrow night uh, on this UMS Steve Reich concert. Um, but we look forward to seeing you continue to grow, hopefully many more Grammys in the future, uh, and also opportunities for us to engage with you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.